What's going on guys? It's the Bulls and the Bears here with a weekly recap video for you today. I'm going to be going over the account to start. As you can see here, you can take a look at all the data. I'm going to move into the analysis on the S&P 500. We're going to talk about credit spreads, what happened this week with those, and the major shift that I'm going to be, uh, the, the dramatic change in my plan with credit spreads. I'll talk about that. And then we'll wrap it up with the wheel strategy, what I had going on this week, what's going to be moving into next week, and how everything's looking. So the account's at $26,371.50. That's up quite a bit from the midweek update video. You can see today's PL, 676 bucks. So a big jump over these last couple days. I'm gonna talk about that. That had everything to do with credit spreads. And uh, so we'll, we'll get into that. But first we are going to talk about um, the S&P 500 and what the heck happened this week, what happened today, and what to expect for next week. So here's the S&P 500, the daily chart. I'm looking at SPX here. Um, I like to zoom out and take a look at this major trend line. I keep bringing it up and the fact that we broke out of it. We broke out of it last week. I didn't think we'd continue, but we did. We continued this week. The Fed meeting happened. We rallied like crazy. Yesterday, we continued the massive rally. Unbelievable. Almost as high as about 4,200. Just about hit 4,200 on the S&P before selling off a little bit. And then today was an ugly day. I mean, this is the, you can't even see a body on this daily candle. It's just a, a wick because we closed 20 cents, only 20 cents lower than we opened. So the, the body is a range of 20 cents. You can't even see it. It's just a massive upper wick. And if I go to the five minute chart and zoom out, you can see we opened way down here. Whoops, that was the wrong thing. We opened way down here. On a big gap down, we still rallied because that's all we can do, it seems like, is rally. But as soon as we filled the gap, we rolled all the way back over and pretty much closed where we opened at that low level. The low level was had to do with the fact that Apple, Google, and Amazon, these major FANG stocks, all missed on earnings. All of them. Apple missed EPS for the first time since 2016, and it had its biggest revenue miss for the first time since 2016. That's kind of big. Amazon missed EPS, Google missed EPS, I think, and revenue too. Um, it, was, it, was an ugly, it was ugly on all fronts with the earnings reports. Even names like Starbucks too missed and, and was selling off. Qualcomm sold off. Um, it, was, it was a bloodbath after, after the bell ring, after, yeah, after the closing bell yesterday. And then the jobs data came out hotter than expected, which is bad for the market because it incentivizes Powell to raise more, um, to do more rate hikes. So that moved the market lower at the open as well. We did recover, filled the gap, but then came all the way back down. So it was an ugly way to finish this week. Even after Thursday's close, I mean, Thursday, we had a massive move higher following the Fed and this is the Fed data right here. So a massive rally on Wednesday, just insane after the Fed. After I finished my midweek update video, we rallied like 80 more points. It was insane. And uh, just when I think it couldn't get any crazier, we gapped up and ripped up on Thursday, as high as just about 4,200. But then we sold off like 50 points. Recovered a little bit of that before opening lower today and, and closing lower today. Um, a pretty ugly close on today way to end the week but nevertheless on the weekly chart weekly candles here it was a green week a little bit of a topping tail a little bit but a green week nonetheless continuing this breakout will this breakout continue i personally feel like we ran up too much too fast especially given the environment even if it was even if we weren't in a recessionary type environment where all these companies are laying off people and missing earnings and stuff uh, I would still think we're due for a pullback. I mean, this this rally here is uh, was was pretty nuts. I mean, we've just about hit over overbought on the RSI on Thursday. So naturally, technically speaking, a pullback is due. And then when you bring in the fundamentals, I think a bigger drawdown is due. At least a test of four thousand, I think, is in is in order for next week, over this next couple weeks. Um, I really don't think we're going to continue higher to like 43, 4,500. I think that's that's uh, bonkers. I don't think that's reasonable. But the markets can remain irrational longer than we can remain solvent. 
I believe JP Morgan said that many decades ago, and it's very true. You have a logical idea of what the market should be doing based on macro ideas, fundamental ideas, but it'll it's driven by fear and greed. It doesn't care about that on a day-to-day -day basis, on a week-to-week -week basis. It will go crazy in any direction and not necessarily mirror your fundamental logical bias. Uh, but that's what I'm thinking with S&P. I think we're due for a pullback. I'd like to see a test of 4,000. And uh, I think that's coming in the next couple of weeks. I could be wrong. I didn't expect this rally, that's for sure. Um, but given the way Apple, Google, Amazon reported, I feel like that might have been a little bit of a wake-up call on this rally to say, all right, maybe we should cool off a little bit in time to take some profits at the very least. So we'll see what happens. But that's my thoughts on the S&P. Now we're going to get into credit spreads. So here's the five-day look on the S&P. We have Monday on the left and then Friday on the right. And then, of course, you can see where Wednesday was when we had the FOMC meeting. On the FOMC meeting, in my midweek update video, I did this live in my video, I opened a credit spread because, and I was looking to do a call credit spread. I was looking for the market to rip so I could sell a nice strike, you know, above the current price for SPX to stay below. Uh, it's a bearish it's a bearish trade, a call credit spread. Somewhere around, um, somewhere around here, I would say, I opened the 4150 call credit spread. So I needed SPX to stay below 4150 by Friday. So it wasn't a zero DTE trade. It was uh, same week, about two days expiration. Um, we continued that same day all the way to 41 just about to 4150. I couldn't believe how much we rallied after I finished my video, um, you know, the remaining hour, hour and a half of the day. It was unbelievable. So my credit spread was already looking pretty trashy. We sold off to end that day, so I felt a little bit better coming back to reality. But then we gapped up, filled, uh, not didn't really fill the gap, but we gapped up, pulled back, and then continued the rally even more, upwards of about 4200 on the S&P. I couldn't believe it. So my, my spread was looking absolutely awful because we were way above my strike. Now, I still had another day left expiration, so I could have given it, I could have given it more time. But um, yeah, it was looking very bad. So what did I do? I decided to double down on my thesis of a bearish trade. When we kept rallying on, th on Thursday, I decided to open another call credit spread at the 4215 strike. I'm about to shrink this down a bit to fit that on the screen. So I opened another call credit spread up here. So I needed SPX to stay below 42.15. And I opened, I went heavy. I went with 10 contracts. So the first spread, I went with one contract, collected a dollar. Max loss would be 400 bucks. Stood to gain a max of 100 bucks. Stood to lose a max of 400. Risk rewards not always will never be there with credit spreads pretty much that's just the nature of the game because the, the win rate's so high you know so i'm not going to get into that but um that was that was the nature of of the pnl and obviously with the price up here and the spread looking like it's going to be a max loss or a big loss at the at the very least i decided to double down pretty much and i went heavy with 10 contracts sold them for a dollar each and collected a thousand dollars up here so a pretty big bet now I closed the first spread on the sell-off, so somewhere around here, when the second spread was looking very good and the first spread was, the loss was coming down a little bit, I decided to close that spread, the first one. And I ended up closing that for, let's see, $271 down. So I lost 271 bucks on the spread, on the, the one that I opened on Wednesday. So not very good, you can put that on the board, minus, $271.40 on that trade. But luckily for me, my second trade where I went in heavy with 10 contracts was working out. And uh, when today opened, I had the closing order out there. I sold it for a dollar each and I was able to close it for 15 cents. So I ended up profiting $85 per contract, 10 contracts. I made $850 gross and after fees and commissions, it was a net profit of $803.24. Okay, so that was a very big gain. And, uh, you know, all those spreads combined together um, ends up being a net P&L on the week with credit spreads, those two spreads of $531.84. So 
So a very nice gain on the week. But that was all driven by me doubling down, trying to get back the loss on the first trade. Because this was obviously, this one at 4150 was not going well. It was The loss was inevitable. So what did I do? Instead of taking the loss, taking my licks and moving on, I hammered the double down button and went all in at a 42.15 level. It worked out, I had nice profit, but that is not a long-term way to trade. The writing's on the wall and I felt it, I got away with it, but it was just me falling into bad habits, not being able to take the loss and walking away, always having to try to dig myself out of a hole to avoid taking the loss or to at the very least make the loss not so bad. That always gets me into trouble. It's gotten me into trouble in every single strategy that there is. Options, stocks, uh, credit spreads, all these different types of strategies. It's always gotten me into trouble. Avoid it, like dealing with loss has always gotten me into trouble. That's why my major announcement, I guess, with the credit spreads is that I'm done with them. I can't be doing them, like I said th this week with that move right there. That really opened my eyes to, see, to, to me saying like I'm still given into bad habits. And uh, if I continue doing credit spreads, it's only a matter of time before something like that happens and it doesn't work out and all of a sudden I lose four grand. That's unacceptable. That doesn't happen with the wheel. I feel a lot safer, a lot more convicted with the wheel. The wheel fits my personality the best. I have an issue taking losses. Every time I have a loss, it, it's two steps back, obviously, right? But I always want to be one step forward. At the end of every day, of every trade, I always want to be one step forward. So when a trade sets me two steps back, I always need to do something else to, to, to erase that and be an end on that one step forward. I just can't stand the setbacks, um, especially if it's a big, big chunk of change that ruins a lot of progress. So I, I give into those bad habits of doubling down, increasing size, whatever. Um, I don't feel that happening with the wheel strategy. I've already been doing it for nine, actually 10 months now. Haven't run into any of those issues. I'm playing with names that I like at major support areas on daily charts, on weekly charts. I'm not using any margin. I can hold names if I need to. If I do, I'll be rewarded for it by being paid dividends. I'll be playing with household names as opposed to, you know, high volatile, um, speculative tech stocks with no earnings just to go just to chase high premiums i'm not doing that i'm just playing with quality names at quality levels and that already um, puts me in a better place to avoid having those bad trades in the first place as opposed to playing on a one minute chart where you know one minute means nothing in the grand scheme of things it could sell off for the next week or two if i'm stuck holding a trade that i got in on the one minute chart you know what i mean if, I'm get, if my entries are based on daily levels and weekly levels, on names that are good quality, that pay dividends, that aren't going anywhere anytime soon, that's already going to give me the edge on the safe, on the safety side of things. And, you know, in, 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 in this strategy, although holding, like bag holding and holding a position seems like an amateur thing to do, it's holding and hoping, that's always what you're not supposed to do, hold and hope, but that's what investing really is. You're holding names that you like and you're hoping they go up and the wheel strategy falls between i like to say between swing trading and investing it leans towards investing and also swing trading as well so that's kind of the, the holding a position is acceptable i feel with the wheel strategy because at the end of the day these are quality names at quality levels that you get in on so it just the wheels that's why the wheel strategy is for me and that's the only thing i should be doing because anything else i fall into my pitfalls my classic pitfalls i couldn't i couldn't discipline myself with those things so i had to move to a strategy that solved it for me and that's what i think the wheel is doing for me so that's uh my take on the wheel strategy that's why i gotta stay away from credit spreads away from all types of trading like that and just stick with the wheel so now that i've said that let's get into the wheel strategy so we'll bring on the graphic, boom. Uh, you know, the credit spreads happened. I can't, I can't deny that. So I do have the graphic there for credit spreads. I did make over $1,500 using credit spreads throughout these past few months. So big chunk of change there. I'm grateful for that. Part of me is lucky that I got that, but it's gotta end. Although it's a great number, 
there was bad things underneath the, the surface that tells me I shouldn't be doing it anymore. But it's there. Can't deny that. Realized profits up over $6,000. That's awesome. You already saw my account at 26 k So that's great. Um, but what happened with the wheel this week? Well, I was in two positions. We'll start with Activision. This was one that I opened, I think, the end of last week. I opened uh, a cash secured put at the $73 strike. I sold one put, collected 60 cents for it. We had a nasty day today, but we were nowhere near the strike. We did not close below it. The put expired worthless. I collected the whole thing. I didn't close it early. And it ended up being a $60 profit on that trade. So it didn't get assigned. You can see here, if I zoom out to like the five-year weekly chart, I really think this is a solid area of support. Um, there's a buyout possibility with Microsoft buying out Activision at a $90 per share value. It's not up there because obviously it's not entirely likely. There is a chance that it won't happen, but there's a chance that it will happen. And I think the $70 area is kind of the safe zone where there's enough people believing that it will happen to support the price there. Because if you are right, that's a $20 per share uh, win that you get by that buyout. So there's a value to that. And I think the $70 area is that support for that thesis. So I was happy getting a sign there, but it didn't, it didn't really come close. So, uh, you know, maybe another day. It already sold off today. If we get a little bit lower, I might play it again. But as for now, uh, we're done there. CVS is another one. This is one that I sold also last week, at the end of last week, with Activision. If I go to the 15-minute chart, I actually closed this on Tuesday. I closed the CVS put on Tuesday, somewhere up here. Um, I opened it on Friday or something. I closed it on Tuesday on January 31st in order to realize the profit in January. So there was like, that was like a $46 gain or something that I realized in January to get my January loss below a thousand. That was really the only reason I did it. So I closed it early, realized a decent profit and, uh, and that was the end of it. But on Wednesday, when stocks were selling off after the Fed meeting, CVS went all the way down below 87. And that gave me another opportunity to sell, a, sell another put. So I sold a put at the 86 strike. I received 47 cents for it. On Thursday, we did dip below it. We got as low as 85.50, right down here, 85.50. But then we pushed up, closed uh, closed just above my strike. Today, gapped way up. We're at 87.50, over a dollar fifty away from my strike. Things were looking good, but then we sold off, and we kept going and going and going, and we closed below my strike. So what does this mean? This means Come Monday, I should be holding 100 shares of CVS. But here's the thing. Here's the best part. Because I received 47 cents on the put, I keep that. That's essentially me recovering the cost of the shares. 47 cents of premium equals $47. So $47 of cost of buying these shares is returned back to me in the form of that put premium which lowers my adjusted cost basis. So instead of buying shares at 86, instead of having a cost basis at, eight, at 86, it'll actually be 47 cents lower. So my cost basis will be at 85.53. That's gonna be my actual cost basis on 100 shares. So uh, adjusted cost basis on 100 shares. So that's the beauty. This illustrates the beauty of the wheel strategy. I'm buying 100 shares at 86. If you bought 100 shares outright at 86, you would be in the red by 23 cents because the stock's below 86. But because I got in by selling a put at this price, I'm actually in the green because my cost base is down here. I'm in the green by 24 cents. So I'm actually in profit territory at this level. And this is actually the best case scenario with the wheel because what sucks at times with the wheel is the only way you get into the position is if the stock went down below your strike and a lot of times when you get your shares you're underwater because that's the only way you could have gotten into it is if it sold off so you usually start in the hole and oftentimes that might mean you can't sell calls because you got to go really far out of the money and you don't have enough premium there this case is the best case where 
it just sells off enough for you to get assigned, but yet it's still right there at your cost basis to where every dollar out of the money you go on your call is, is in profit territory. I can sell an at the money call at like 86 and still be in profit territory and get a lot of premium at the same time. That's the best case scenario with um, the wheel. And as of right now, as long as CVS opens around this area, that's the position I'm in. A great position with the price above my cost basis and my ability to sell a full week's worth of premium on a covered call. So that'll be great. I don't know what the premiums are looking like. It is a higher price name than what I usually play with. I usually try to play something at $60 or less because that'd be a quarter of my account. I did go a little bit higher to play a quality name that I trusted at a good level. Um, so the premium should be decent. Um, I'll, I might look to sell something at the 87 strike perhaps. Um, that'll be a good return. That'll be like $150 return on the shares plus whatever the premium I get for it. Um, so that's a good area. If I look at the five year weekly chart, you can see why I like this area a lot. Um, we had support right here in this green box, but it's a little bit below that. At the very least, you would expect some support coming up here in uh, the $80 region, 80 to $85 region. So I'm liking that name. It's a great quality name. It pays dividends. The last dividend was, um, I missed it. It was a, looks like a month ago or so. It was uh, 60 cents. So if I do get a dividend on this, I would expect about $60 in dividend income, which is very nice, but that won't happen for another couple months. So on Monday, I should have 100 shares of CVS. I already have it in my banner down below. It's at a very good level for call selling first thing on Monday. So I'm very excited about that. Activision expired worthless. Um, we'll look to see if I can maybe play it again though. If it does sell off, the selling continues on Activision. I'll look to reopen one at 73 or lower. I like this buy zone. So I think that's a good play. Everything else, I mean, I was watching DocuSign. That thing's ripping up. Uh, Pfizer's close too. Pfizer's one I'm, I was looking at. It had earnings. I was hoping to sell a put after this earnings drop. I wasn't paying attention. It gave me a good opportunity, but then it ripped up and went out with, went on without me. But it's still close to my buy zone, my demand zone. So if it does roll over again, I would like to try to play Pfizer down by 42 or lower. Google is what I'm interested in, but it's too elevated. I need it closer to 95. Intel is another one, affordable too, but it's ripping out of the demand zone. So uh, not currently close. And then Tesla was one I was watching. Man, I wish I got in near 100. I kept saying in my videos how it's such a great opportunity. And there's the opportunity and I have nothing to show for it. So that's sad, uh, but I'll keep it on the wheel watch just because uh, everyone loves Tesla, including me. But that's it, guys. That's the video. We'll go back to Weeble quick. Here's the account yet again. I still have my puts in the positions window. That won't update until Monday. So Activision will disappear and CVS will turn into 100 shares of CVS. And that's the video. So thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, please hit that like button. Subscribe for more content. Leave a comment down below. I do enjoy reading your stuff. And as always, guys, I'll see you all next time.